Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Nadim Galu and I'm the Senior Medical Director for Structural Heart at Abbott. We welcome you this evening and appreciate your attendance. Uh, you are taking time away from your family to spend it with us and we hope that this will be a worthwhile engagement for you. Uh, the title of today's talk is Optimizing Tabby Deliverability Today. And uh, we have uh, some very accomplished presenters today. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Ethan Korngold. Uh, he is Division Chair of Interventional Cardiology and Structural Heart at the Providence Heart Institute in Portland, in Portland, Oregon. Uh, he's a graduate of Harvard College and the Washington University School of Medicine. He completed his medical residency and fellowships in cardiovascular disease, interventional cardiology, vascular medicine, and intervention at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Dr. Korngold is currently engaged in clinical research, serves on medical advisory boards, and has co-authored publications which have appeared in Circulation, The Lancet, Annals of Thoracic Surgery, and JAK Interventions. He has served as faculty at national and international conferences. And our uh, second presenter will be Dr. Ibrahim Sultan. And Dr. Sultan earned his medical degree from Cornell Medical College and completed his residency in general surgery at the Johns Hopkins University Hospital. He subsequently completed residencies in cardiothoracic surgery at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. And he also served there as an advanced fellow in thoracic aortic surgery and minimally invasive valve surgery. He is presently director of the UPMC Center for Thoracic Aortic Disease and surgical director of the UPMC Center for Heart Valve Disease. He serves as principal investigator on multiple research files and has published over 150 articles on cardiovascular and aortic disease in multiple uh, uh, reputable journals. So with those introductions, uh, I am going to just say a few words about housekeeping issues. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing. Questions that you may have can be submitted at any time through the Q&A feature on your screen. And at the end of the presentation, there will be a survey provided, and we hope that you'll take some time to fill this out so we can uh, see what we did right and what we need to improve on. Just a few words about the Navator uh, valve and the FlexNav delivery system. Uh, I just want to highlight a few things, and our speakers will also address uh, some of these benefits. Uh, one of the ma major benefits, particularly for interventional cardiologists, uh, are these very large cells, which, which can easily accommodate at least one, if not more, guide catheters, including eight French guide catheters. This becomes important when you talk about coronary reaccess. Uh, at post tower if that's needed. The other important feature is the uh, outer navicele cuff, which is actually uh, an active sealing cuff uh, with uh, billowing of the uh, uh, microsinuses during diastole, which mitigates PDL to a significant degree. Uh, the uh, navicular valve also features best in class neoscurit height, and this becomes very important when we talk about uh, lifetime management. And some features about the delivery system, which uh, I think really uh, uh, make this a best-in-class delivery system. Uh, I want to highlight the stability layer. And this is unique because it really allows for a very controlled deployment of the valve with minimal motion and movement of the valve as it exits the delivery system. So there are very few surprises and jumps. Uh, the Device is also incredibly flexible, allowing you to navigate very tortuous anatomy uh, with minimal risk uh, for aortic valve injury. Um, and then the handle is also very ergonomically designed, and, and uh, the ease of use is incredible. Uh, so this is uh, some; these are some numbers I want to share. Some outcomes: uh, uh, in 30 days, the Navator valve, along with the FlexNav delivery system. Uh, demonstrated 0% moderate to severe PDL, 1.9% all-cause mortality, 1.9% disabling stroke, approximately 4% major vascular complications, and incredibly the mean gradient was in single digits at, at 7.4 millimeters. This valve is, is uh, well placed for issues related to lifetime management. So when we look at the life history of a, of a patient that receives a valve, of course, today, we're most concerned as we deliver the valve with how easy it is to deliver and safely deliver. 
at the annulus, uh, and, and also ease of use is important. Tomorrow, uh, we, uh, of course, are concerned about gradients, as I've told you uh, in the previous slide, single-digit single gradients are the norm with this valve. There's a minimal risk for PPM, particularly when you talk about the appropriate technique and excellent PVL mitigation. And the road ahead, the Navator valve is very well placed for lifetime management issues such as coronary access, uh, I mentioned the lowest middle skirt height and it's a class of self-expanding valves. And also for other uh, um, uh, uh, important factors which are being discussed now on the podium, such as uh, where to place the valve uh, for future potential tab and tab procedures. So with that, uh, I want to transition to Dr. Ethan Korngold we will be talking about optimizing tabby deliverability today with best practices and case examples. Dr. Korngold, uh, the stage is yours. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna uh, talk to you about the Navator valve and really focus on deliverability and key advantages that this device has in terms of deliverability. Here are my disclosures. So, uh, the ease of use with this device really starts with the handle. And this handle is really well designed for what we need it to do. So um, just sort of highlighting some of the important features. There is the stability layer, which uh, enables the valve to be placed very precisely and sort of exactly where you think it should go. The deployment indicator, which gives a visual representation of uh, how deployed the valve is. You can see the white and gray area um, indicate where you hit the point of no return. So it's very sort of clear how far you are in the deployment. There's the automatic lock button, which is really the safety. You wheel the wheel, it hits the point of no return and it stops, the lock button pops up. You can evaluate the valve, assess it. And if you decide that you wanna continue with deployment, you push the lock button in and then continue the deployment. It's very intuitive. It's exactly how you think it should be. And then on the far right are the macro slide buttons to help uh, close the capsule when you're done after the deployment. Um, this, uh, the capsule is very well designed. It is a, um, the nose cone is very uh, uh, easy to uh, enter into the femoral artery with. Um, there's really not a lot of sort of ridges or, uh, or stops that you hit when you are advancing it. And, um, and what's really key about this device is that the, the capsule is very flexible when compared to other devices such as the Evolute. So the valve frame itself is, um, has less metal in it. And so as a result, the capsule that's need to, that needs to contain it is a much softer, more flexible capsule. And that gives this device really key advantages when it comes to deliverability. Um, what I really like about this device is that patients are very stable when I deploy. So I do not routinely rapidly pace during the deployment uh, and patients are hemodynamically stable during the deployment. You never hit that point where the valve is an inverted funnel and the patient gets hypotensive. It starts functioning immediately when you deploy it. And so I think about this valve when I have patients with very low ejection fractions, patients with unrevascularized coronary disease or patients uh, in whom I really do not want to rapid pace. It works very, very well. Um, so the total package is really uh, very impressive. It's stable, it's accurate, it's a very safe, controlled deployment. When it comes to uh, the sort of French size and diameter of vessels you can access, uh, there are some key advantages. So if you look at the vessel diameters, uh, the, uh, and the outer diameter profile when compared to Evolute FX, the smaller valve sizes are similar, but the larger valve sizes have key advantages when it comes to outer diameter and minimum vessel diameter. Um, when it comes to uh, just going down the, the table, when it comes to cell size, another key advantage compared to Evolute is the coronary access. So the cells are much, much larger than the Evolute FX. And uh, when you see them side by side, it's really quite dramatic. Navator is made of bovine pericardium as opposed to porcine pericardium in the Evolute FX. Uh, the cuff material is made out of polyethylene fabric and that cuff really has, uh, has helped tremendously with paravalve their leak. Uh, the device is recapturable. 
and it's intraannular, which really leaves a lot of options when it comes to future coronary access. As far as small vessel access, so comparing the Navator to the Evolute FX, the, um, the small sizes are similar to the Evolute FX, but at the large size, it's, uh, it's significantly lower in profile. Where I think the, the uh, Navator really shines, though, is in its flexibility and deliverability through tortuous anatomy. And so in developing this system, the engineers put together this, this torture test um, using a uh, highly convoluted aortic arch and aortic annulus that was, uh, a that was designed after reviewing CT scans uh, to, uh, to sort of approximate what a, a sort of standard challenging aorta would be. Um, it also introduces in the iliacs. And as we all know, the iliac arteries can be challenging. Sometimes they dive uh, sort of into and out of what we're seeing on fluoroscopy. So they're taking lots of twists and turns. And having a valve that's able to navigate that uh, is really uh, an advantage and puts a lot less trauma on the arteries. So this is the sort of torture test model using, uh, uh, using the CT scans. And the engineers ran through the Navator with FlexNav and the Evolute Pro. And to make a long story short, there's a lot less push force in getting the Navator through challenging tortuous anatomy than compared to the, uh, to the uh, uh, Evolute system. And that's really uh, due in large part to the capsule and the design of the uh, stability layer in the, uh, in the Navator. So when I have a case with very tortuous anatomy, here's a, a nice example, and this is, these are cases that we see every day. Um, the FlexNav really uh, shines in going through it. These are some still pictures. I'll show you some uh, some pictures of some cases of challenging, challenging anatomy with um, with Cine images. In general, my implant technique is I'll use uh, I use uh, the perclose uh, devices for closure. I actually these days I'm typically using a single perclose um, for the procedure, and then if there's residual bleeding. After the procedure, I'll either add an additional perclose or add an angioseal to it, but I find that 80, 90% of the time, a single perclose is adequate to maintain hemostasis. I'll start with a 14 French sheath, cross the valve with an AL1. I use an extra small safari wire on virtually all of my cases. I'll do balloon valvuloplasty and then switch the 14 French sheath to the Navator system. Uh, after the implant, if post dilation is not needed, I'll just remove the Navator system over the Safari wire and deploy that, that perclose. Um, and if post dilation is needed, then I'll take up the Navator, replace that 14 French sheath, and then do post dilation with a, uh, with a balloon. So uh, to show you some cases, uh, first case is a 93-year-old woman with severe aortic stenosis in the preserved EF. Annulus is measuring to 358 millimeters. So the plan is to do a 25 millimeter portico with FlexNav and pre-dilate with a 20 millimeter true balloon. In general, uh, we guide pre-dilation based on the minor axis of the, um, of the uh, annulus, but uh, this sort of varies just depending on the particular anatomy of the patient. So we picked a 20 millimeter true balloon. Uh, here is the uh, aorta. So you can see very challenging uh, very tortuous, uh, so the sizes looked okay, and there's some calcium in the aorta, but the um, but uh, but uh, not a lot of narrowing, but just high high tortuosity at all levels. And as can be expected, uh, you know the the uh, catheters and the wires laid exactly like they did on the CT scan. So started with the 14 French sheath, and then did the balloon valvuloplasty. That was the easy part, and now it's time to deliver the valve. And so here is the sort of real-time Cine images of the valve going up. You can see because the device is so flexible and the capsule is so flexible, it really took no time in getting the FlexNav system up and around the uh, through the iliacs, through the aorta, and all the way delivered to the valve. It's just running again. So it was really no problem whatsoever. This is a case that you know, I think you see the CT are concerned, but with the Navator, it was just not a problem. Uh, here is, uh, uh, even with all the tortuosity, there's still a lot of control over the valve and the deployment. Um, here's the valve, uh, just taking some pictures as it's released. And this case did require a post dilation. So I'm doing the post dilation there, but got a great result. 
Um, and despite uh, going through all the twists and turns uh, at the end of the case, the iliac arteries look perfect, so no issues there. Second case, an 87-year-old woman with severe aortic stenosis and a preserved ejection fraction, annulus is 458 squared millimeters. Plan was to do a 29 millimeter portico flex nav and pre dilate with a 20 millimeter, sorry, 22 millimeter true balloon. So, in this case, uh, the iliacs did not look great. So, you can see there's this area in the right iliac, which was the preferable iliac, but that had a minimum diameter of 4.15 square, uh, 4.15 millimeters and with circumferential calcification. There's a lot of tortuosity in the iliac as well. So the plan was to do a shockwave intravascular lithotripsy with the seven millimeter balloon and then advance a 29 millimeter cortico flex nav um, to uh, treat the valve. So here's the uh, IVL. So this is a shockwave with a seven millimeter balloon. You can see in this first inflation, there's definitely a waste right at this area. But then as, uh, as this continues to be treated, the waste expands and, uh, and that's really encouraging that we'll have a clearer pathway with the device. And this is again, real-time Cine of advancing the device. Uh, this was definitely more of a challenge. Um, you know, we, you can, uh, so we, we sort of barely cleared enough of a pathway with the IVL and it required some pushing, but uh, with the flexibility of the device going through the tortuosity and, uh, and just sort of careful, steady pushing it was able to get through that uh, area of, um, of uh, narrowing just fine. And uh, with the stability layer, you know, even though we're through all that uh, difficult tortuosity and narrowing, uh, there's still excellent control over the valve itself when it comes to the, the deployment. So here's the valve, uh, we're lining it up for the release and there's the release on the right side and uh, we're left with trace AI. Here's the final picture. So despite uh, the, the uh, shock wave and despite uh, pushing so hard through that lesion, uh, it still looks perfect on the way out. And that's what we found with, uh, with the shock wave cases and cases of borderline anatomy that um, you know, if, we, if you do a careful shock wave before the fact, um, I almost never see anything that's a dissection or a, a residual stenosis or anything that needs to be treated with a stent on the way out. So this looked uh, well, this was a patient without claudication or peripheral disease. So, uh, so that was totally fine to leave alone. Um, final case, 83 year old man with severe AS and ejection fraction of 35, annulus is 472 squared millimeters. Plan was to do a 27 Navator and pre-dilate with a 20 millimeter true balloon. Um, and this is a um, this is a good case because um, you know his ejection fraction is low, EF of thirty five percent. And again, with the navigator, you really don't need to rapidly pace these patients, and they're hemodynamically stable the entire way through the case. So it's really reassuring to me when you're dealing with these low EF patients. And in this case, the iliacs looked okay, but the issue was his distal aorta. And you know you can see in this still picture that there is. Um, just some shagginess, you know, there's thrombus in the aorta, there's what looks like a chronically healed dissection in the uh, distal abdominal aorta, and there's, um, there's maybe even some saccular aneurysms in that distal abdominal aorta. And this is a case where I really prefer to go through that uh, with, a, um, with an encapsulated valve. So, you know, if you're going through with the flex nav system, that's just a smooth, um, encapsulated valve. There's no rough edges. There's uh, there's a hydrophil uh, hydrophilic coating on the system, and it just sort of slides right through without causing trauma. Whereas if you're going through with a sapien, you have the uh, the unencapsulated valve. You have the metal frame and all the valve material that's really just sort of scraping up through that. It really raises concern for me through either lifting up a flap or uh, causing distal embolization of thrombus. Um, given my choice, I would go through this with an encapsulated valve every time. I don't have great pictures of going through this, but uh, you can see on the left, there's the uh, lining up for the deployment. Um, the valve deployed well uh, with uh, trace uh, AI at the, at the end of the case. And the uh, iliacs, uh, even though it's very tortuous, looks, uh, looks very good.
So those are uh, some cases, and that's my experience. Uh, I really find it to be a highly deliverable valve, and it's a, it's a great option to have for our patients. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Korngold. Uh, those were some incredible cases and some pretty impressive vascular anatomy that you traversed. Um, <laughs> if, uh, uh, if you would allow me to ask uh, about your technique, uh, as, as you know, in the early days of Tower, our goal was to uh, avoid major vascular complications, deliver the valve safely, and, and sort of get out. And uh, uh, primary pacemaker were thought of as a price to pay for, for getting a new valve. Uh, we have moved beyond that. Nuances have developed in techniques to try to mitigate or reduce the risk of permanent pacemaker implant. Uh, can you talk to us about some of the things that you found are helpful during the technical aspects of the procedure? Uh, uh, in the context of FlexNav and Navitor that allow you to deliver the, the valve with a particular depth in mind? Uh, and and um, what are the, some of the things that you do as tips and tricks that uh, you found are helpful? Um, great question. So, you know, I think what's, um, what's so nice about this valve and what's made adoption of this valve really easy, it's, it's just very intuitive. It's, uh, it deploys like a self-expanding uh, femoral artery stent. Um, you watch the valve frame, you unsheath it with the system. Because of the stability layer, the valve really just stays put, and you have a lot of control over exactly where it goes. Um, you know, we put in a fair amount of evolutes, and we have been, uh, you know, there's a lot of compensation for it. You know it's going to jump, so you start a little bit high, and you're expecting it to jump forward, and the evolute jumps a little bit less, but it still jumps. Um, the, 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 the FX that is, it jumps a little bit less, but it still jumps. And, um, and with this valve, it's really just watch the frame, desheath it, it's going to stay there. And because it's so predictable, um, you can really, um, uh, you can really uh, get a nice high deployment and be sort of safe and reliable and know that what you see is what you get. Um, I really like also the ability to assess it when it's almost fully deployed, the valve is really contacting the annulus uh, at the point of no return when the safety pops up. Uh, you're getting good blood flow, um, you, um, and you can really sort of see how the valve is doing before you do the final release. And I haven't really had the valve move significantly at all after you do the final release. So it's, it's, it, those kind of things give me confidence and able to, uh, in, in order to do a high deployment, and our pacemaker rates have been very good. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I'll ask you one more question. As an interventional cardiologist, uh, I'm sure you're always concerned about uh, future coronary access. Um, what are your thoughts uh, about coronary access if needed with uh, Navitor uh, as it sort of compares to the uh, other valves that are outside, uh, that are, out, that are non-Abbott valves, uh, such as other tall valves, for example, uh, mentioned FX. Um, and uh, of course, also the, the balloon expandable and lower, short, shorter profile valves. Where do you think uh, Navitor fits in vis a vis coronary access? And is that a concern for you? I think with this valve, I'm not really concerned. It's an intraannular valve, so the valve material is, is in the annulus, and the cell size is so large um, that it's easy to navigate a catheter as a pathway through to find the coronary arteries. Um, when I am dealing with, in particular, a small, and, and I should say, you know, one thing that, that is really important about Navitor is the gradients that you get are excellent. So I find the gradients are really, frankly, similar to the gradients that I see with Evolute. It's just, um, I'm sure you'll go into this uh, in, in other uh, scenarios, but the, the way that the valve is sewn into the frame and the way that the, the valve is actually designed allows for low gradients. So if you're dealing with a person with a small annulus and you want to have excellent gradients, but you also want to preserve coronary access, this is really the go-to valve that I find. Well, thank you. I think that's a great point, uh, Dr. Korngold. Uh, the Navitor valve is, is unique and it's a self-expanding valve, yet it's intraannular. And I think that's a a couple of uh, points for that is you have a low near skirt height, which uh, comes into play when you're talking about lifetime management issues. And also, you know, we were all sort of in the early years of TAVR uh, told that you had to be super annular based on surgical valve experience uh, and also experience with the early uh, uh, 
early self-explanatory valve that you had to be super annular to get single digits gradients. And I, and I think the Navator valve has demonstrated that's not the case. It's uh, leaflet design uh, and uh, other factors, uh, not necessarily annularity, super annular versus intra-annular. So I, I think uh, great points by you. Uh, I'm looking in, uh, we don't have any questions, but I do encourage uh, anyone who's got any questions to please uh, chime in. Um, we want this to be interactive. Uh, again, thank you so much, Dr. Korngold, for an excellent presentation and uh, case reviews. Um, and we're going to uh, now transition uh, to Dr. Uh, Sultan, and he's going to continue our uh, discussion about tabby deliverability. Uh, Ibrahim, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Nadim. Uh, <clears throat> those, those are some great cases, uh, Ethan. Looking forward to some more discussion. Uh, here are my disclosures. Uh, a, a little bit about our TAVI background. Uh, we've been involved, obviously, since the early days of, uh, of TAVI, well, uh, you know, closer to 15 years now. And majority of our experience was, was with self-expanding valve as part of the initial pivotal trials. Uh, we were late adopters to cusp overlap uh, in 2020, and we did that because we were unsatisfied with our pacemaker rate. The reason we liked self-expanding valves had to do with hemodynamics. We, we knew clearly based on, on, on decades and decades and decades of surgical valve experience that patient prosthesis mismatch is a serious issue. And so we gravitated towards self-expanding valves, really took that, uh, uh, took that on, and but at the same time, we're dissatisfied with pacemaker rates, adopted cusp overlap, uh, perhaps a little bit later, but we're able to drop our pacemaker rate into the single digit. And that was really our background. What was also more important to us is that our outcomes are, were the first 3,000 of current generation uh, self-expanding versus balloon expanding uh, outcomes be same. And what I mean by that is mortality, stroke, vascular complications, and pacemaker rates. And so when, when we see something like that, and I think it's important for operators to understand that, you know, technology has tremendous tries in the TAVI world over time. Uh, and so as we look towards doing what we think is a good, uh, perhaps, implant for a patient, it's important to keep in mind uh, that it's perhaps more than what's uh, ease of use but really thinking about what is best for outcomes, not just in the short term, and as Nadim alluded to, not just getting out of the lab, but really looking for, for the next 5, 10, 15 years. So that's what prompted us to really look at Navitor because it really fulfilled the two major things we were looking for. We wanted to look, and as indication creep occurs and as we continue to do TAVI in younger and younger patients, we wanted to look at an intraannular valve with superannular hemodynamics. Uh, what I mean by that is an intraannular valve has, has a few features, uh, several of which were already spoken to. Uh, the large cell design allows for coronary access, whether it's urgent, emergent, or elective, uh, depending on wherever the patient is, perhaps in, in the rural area or in the community. But an intraannular valve also allows, uh, quite frankly, for a tab and tap option, something we talk more and more about uh, over time. At the same time, we're able to do this without compromising hemodynamics and mitigating patient prosthesis mismatch. Uh, we've seen this in Navitor approval data. Uh, we've seen this in our own local data over the past couple of hundred Navitor patients and have been very pleased with it, not immediately, not just immediately, but really on 30 days and on follow-up uh, up to one year. A couple of features that are relevant here for the valve itself is this active, what I like to call an animated Navi-Seal cuff, allows for an increasing, uh, increasing sealing zone and helps mitigate PVL, which is why you see such a low, almost a 0% uh, moderate and severe PVL in the Navitor approval data. Uh, again, talking about hemodynamics, a single di digit gradient that stays not only at discharge, not only at 30 days, but in our experience uh, carries on uh, close to a year based on this platform. Uh, and, and stays consistent without, without increase. Uh, a large cell design, nearly a 21 French catheter that can be dr driven through one of the large cells and allows for good coronary access uh, for, for plenty of, uh, of interventional cardiology operators who may not necessarily be familiar uh, with TAVI, uh, but may be taking care of a patient who had uh, a TAVI implant and is now presenting with perhaps an acute coronary syndrome. There's really two aspects to this which makes this special. It's not just a valve itself. You know, we think that 
combination of the delivery system and the valve is what really allows for this predictable and accurate uh, deployment. So having a patient, having you know, marginal vascular anatomy, as you've seen, tortuous anatomy, and sometimes having trouble even getting a 12 or 14 front sheath up, but allowing the, the delivery system to go past without any problems is really, really uh, good to see and, and experience. And, and with the amount of flexibility that we have, having accuracy and predictability in deployment, meaning that where you think you're going to end up is where you end up, is very, very important. And that is what we like to see. Now, now, arguably, some of the other positions, such as recapturable, repositional, are common to other self-expanding platforms. But the predictability and accuracy of where you implant, where you land, is what makes it special. Just to give you a comparison, uh, many of you may know this, but this is a slightly deeper dive. Uh, obviously, when it comes to the outer diameter for Navitor with the FlexNav delivery system, marginal vascular anatomy are, are very, uh, are, are very, very useful in those scenarios. Uh, can really push the limit when it comes to vascular access. Uh, the sheet size is, uh, the equivalent is about 14 to 15, uh, treats range of uh, angular range from about 19 to 27 uh, millimeters. Uh, obviously, uh, large cell designs we talked about, bovine uh, pericardial leaflets, uh, has this animated navy seal cuff that you'll see shortly in a movie. And again, more importantly, while having all these options and in intra-annular design. Now, these were our data from Navitor post-approval uh, study, excuse me, Navitor approval study, uh, which were 30-day outcomes. Uh, this is a prospective uh, universal multi-center single arm study. This only looked into high and extreme risk patients. Uh, All-cause mortality in this patient population was exceedingly low at 1.9%, so is disabling stroke. Uh, new pertinent pacemaker is 19%, which we'll talk about uh, shortly. As you can see, vascular complication rate very low in this pop patient population, and a 0% moderate or, or severe PDL. Uh, single digit gradient, as you would expect. So, fair, from a clinical outcome standpoint, really good results. Uh, this is something we already talked about. Uh, this allows for, again, uh, as you use this delivery system in patients with small uh, vessel axis. Now, a couple of things to look at this as you teach, if you're at a teaching institution uh, or you have uh, younger, uh, uh, younger partners who you work with, uh, th this allows, the deployment indicator allows you to see where you are uh, and not necessarily count uh, on, uh, on perhaps how the scroll wheel is going or what you're seeing on the screen. There's a lockout button as you go through, which locks you out. It doesn't matter uh, how fast you want to go. Uh, that, that parks you at 80% so you can reassess, see where you look at, uh, and then go back and release if you're happy. Uh, this uh, movie gives you an idea of what we're talking about. Again, uh, this is the Navaseal uh, cup, uh, large cell design, uh, and again, an intraannular valve with, with optimal radial force. Uh, the cells are curved inwards, atraumatic. It's a low profile system with hydrophilic coating uh, with a significant amount of flexibility. Well, the nose cone uh, is always concerning when it's in the heart. Uh, you know, having an atraumatic and soft nose cone does uh, help uh, from that perspective to avoid any uh, injury or septal damage. Uh, again, we use a pre-curved, uh, pre-shaped pre-curved wire. Uh, we've transitioned to using a now a circular wire uh, using modified cusp overlap technique, which I'll go into. Uh, if you're concerned about where you are, you can again recapture, uh, reposition, resheath, and 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 sure that you are in a comfortable spot. Once you've looked at it in two views, uh, you go ahead and release comfortably um, and withdraw the entire system. So we changed uh, some of this based on our experience with, uh, with core valve and, and Evolute and, and moving over to Navitor. Uh, we start off with regular cusp overlap aortography. We pre-dilate in 100% of patients, the minor axis using a, a, a excuse me, semi-compliant balloon. Uh, we did not use the wire for deployment, so we used an extra small safari, and now we've migrated to using the circular wire. Uh, we tried to fast pace. Again, this, this valve, as Ethan mentioned, can be deployed without pacing, but really you don't hurt hemodynamics that much when you fast pace, about 140 beats per minute. Uh, this allows you really to be exceedingly stable while at the same time maintaining hemodynamics, right? So again, you can get to 80%, do an aortogram, both in your modified cusp overlap view and uh, in an alternative view that ensures that you are at a comfortable depth 
before releasing. And we typically tend to do this in LAO to see what the left sinus looks like once you've identified the non-sinus. We'll give you an example of a couple of cases we're looking at. Uh, this is a very standard 81-year-old uh, woman, uh, progressive dyspnea exertion, classic severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, that multiple orthopedic procedure, wheelchair bound, uh, has a, a known right bundle branch block. Uh, three cusp valve. Um, uh, the first thing, again, we do is isolate the non-coronary cusp or try to get a near cusp overlap or a cusp overlap angle right away. Uh, we cross the valve, uh, standard uh, L1 and straight wire. Uh, we use a Zemet balloon in virtually most cases, unless uh, we're looking at a patient with a uh, bicuspid aortic valve with a calcified raffae where we feel that we need to rupture a raffae. Uh, this, is, uh, this is done in, again, 100% of the patients that really allows us uh, to seat the valve comfortably and has reduced the number of post deployments we've done really with all self expanding valves. Uh, we slowly inch up uh, carefully, allowing the nose cone to descend. And while we are uh, rapid uh, uh, pacing or fast pacing, depending on what the hemodynamics allow us to do, uh, we will start deploying the valve. Uh, the nice part about this is it's, it's very uh, easy to look at. This dot or radiopic marker is about three millimeters uh, from the bottom of the valve. And if you put this, uh, you, if you put this dot really at the bottom of the pigtail, uh, you are going to be at three millimeters ninety. Five percent of the time, and that's where we would like to deploy. So again, take that dot. Here's obviously this is deployed to about eighty percent. We go into our modified cusp overlap view. Uh, it tends to be a little bit more areo caudal. Uh, take a picture, ensure that we've got good contact. Uh, go towards the left side. Uh, make sure again, uh, go to an LAO view. Make sure we've got good contact with the left sinus, and then release as we're fast pacing. Now. Uh, we like to fast pace or rapid pace as we release because we think it's important as the valve, depending on how much stored tension you have and uh, what kind of tortuosity you're dealing with, how this valve tends to settle. Uh, we do think it's important. Uh, again, post aortic ramp, uh, no, virtually no PVL, it lands where we expected it to land, and a single digit gradient, which is what we've come to expect. Give you another example patient with a horizontal aorta, young woman, but uh, severe intellectual disabilities. Uh, endometrial cancer, limited life expectancy, has a right bundle branch block and a left anterior circular block. Uh, very eccentric LVOT, uh, relatively small annulus, very low coronary height. Uh, the left corner, the right coronary is actually coming off the left. So again, an anomalous coronary, low coronary height. Uh, you can see what the sinus height is there. Um, coarctation and uh, significant a horizontal aorta or vertical annulus, depending on what you want to call that. Uh, thankfully, uh, the raffae tend to be not calcified uh, or not calcified in this scenario, uh, which does help us. Uh, this is crossing the valve is obviously not as painful, and it's always interesting when the when the apex of the heart is almost above the annulus as you're viewing this. Uh, again, we isolate the non uh, coronary sinus as we usually do. Uh, do a balloon valvuloplasty uh, as per standard swap over to uh, a safari or a circular wire and then bring our uh, uh, bring our delivery system uh, to go ahead and deploy now uh, we purposely want it to be a little bit deeper uh, in this particular patient again uh, the rationale for that again low coronary height anomalous coronary uh, sinus segment restriction small annulus uh, so a variety of reasons why we did not want to be very high in this particular patient and you can note the flexibility of how flexible the system is really. Again, the nose cone tends to be pointing almost upwards uh, away uh, from the greater curve and away uh, towards the apex. So it gives you an idea of how flexible the system is uh, with and without the wire. Uh, uh, trace PVL that was initially detected continue to be a trace PVL at 30 uh, to 60 days afterwards and a 10 millimeter gradient. This is important to note. You know, this was a 23 millimeter Navitor. And our experience has really been that unless it's a 23 millimeter Navitor, for the most part, you will end up with single digit gradient and you will stay with single digit gradient. Um, if it's a 23 millimeter Navitor, which is equivalent to a 20 millimeter Sapien 3 or a 23 millimeter Evolute, you may get a 10 millimeter gradient, 10 to 12 millimeter gradient. That's, that's not necessarily surprising. And despite different valve sizes, different anatomies, alternative axis, transdermal axis, uh, uh, three cusp, two cusp, etc. You know, we've really uh, we've really been pleased with this performance and has become our default uh, high risk valve. Uh, excuse me, default valve to use in high and extreme risk patients uh, in our practice. 
all while, again, expecting a single-digit uh, gradient that's sustainable over time. So where do we think this shines or where do we think this has a place in, in, in the current uh, uh, market as we decide uh, what's on the shelf for our patients? So patients where you have horizontal anatomy, you're looking for self-expandable valve, predictability during deployment is important. Uh, patients with marginal vascular access and extreme tortuosity, Ethan uh, showed you some great cases and it allows you to get good deliverability. Uh, small annuli, again, it's an intraannular valve with superannular hemodynamics. Uh, I think the, the myth of, and uh, Nadine pointed out that the myth that you have to be superannular to get hemodynamics, we know is not accurate. It has more to do with the valve design than just being super or intraannular. Uh, we validated this. This was presented, uh, our experience was presented at CRT and TVT uh, this past year. Uh, alternative access, most TAVI delivery systems are not de uh, designed for alternative access, but we've used this in significant number of alternative access cases. Uh, and we have seen, uh, quite frankly, uh, you know, very, very good stability during deployment. I'll stop there and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for, for an excellent presentation, Dr. Sultan. Um, if it's okay, uh, my, may I ask you a couple of questions um, about uh, your uh, approach and, um, and some, uh, some other uh, unique perspective that you have. You know, you're, you're a heart surgeon, so you've got the perspective of heart surgery, but you're also a, a catheter-based uh, endovascular specialist. So I, I want to pick your brain about one thing that I think is really important, and that's uh, you mentioned it in your talk, and that was... Uh, uh, patient prosthesis mis mismatch. This was, uh, as you know, a, a, a term coined decades ago by Dr. Shahid uh, Rahim Rahimatullah. And interestingly, this, this phrase is now being used more than ever, even, even more than when we, were, we talked about it in the context of surgical valve. So with your unique perspective of, of both, please talk to us about what PPM means to the patient, both in terms of uh, quality of life, but also what it could potentially mean long term um, from, from both the surgical perspective and also from a, a TAVI operator perspective? Yeah, no, I think great question study. I mean, I mean, the, I think where you start off is very important to these patients, right? So what the first valve you put in these patients, again, as we continue putting younger patients, important, important, because, you know, that is your foundation and that is your setup. So where you move from there is highly dependent on the first valve. So we know, and again, you make a great point. We've known about patient prosthesis mismatch for a decade. It was just reintroduced, I would say, into the interventional cardiology world when Howie Herman published uh, his paper using the TVT registry. Uh, it was really brought to light how significant of an effect this has. What we know from patients, and this should be no different for transcatheter versus surgical patients, is if you have patient prosthesis mismatch, you're likely going to have a significant difference with respect to mortality over the mid to long, not over the short term, but mid to long term, and you will have higher risk of heart failure readmissions. Uh, we also know that once you have a small valve implanted in patient prosthesis of this match, the next valve you will probably get, uh, valve and valve, uh, you are going to continue again uh, with a smaller valve down the line. So this is kind of a gift that will keep on giving. So I do think it's very important to start off with a good foundation that'll set you up for success down the line. Thank you for that excellent overview on, on PPM. It's such an important topic and timely topic. Uh, Dr. Korngold, I'm gonna transition to you for a, a quick question from me, and then we've also got a couple of questions in the chat that we'll, we'll uh, bring forward. We've talked a little bit about cusp overlap and uh, particularly what that's meant uh, for technique um, in terms of uh, particularly pacemaker implants. Talk to us a little bit about uh, what cusp overlap is, uh, why that particular view is, is unique and important, um, and how you use that in your practice, and what's that, what do you think um, uh, that means to patients for, for, for uh, pacemaker implants? Yeah, so, you know, the, the sort of standard cusp overlap technique um, is, uh, is to isolate the non-carnary cusp and, and create a, and get an angle where you have overlap of the right and left carnaries. And the, the idea is that in general self-expanding valves, the valve frame is going to be pinned to the greater curve of the aorta and pinned to the non-carnary cusp when it's deployed. And so by isolating the non-carnary cusp, you can really get um, your valve uh, as high as possible in order to get low pacemaker rates. Um, and it's, uh, I, I think, 
uh, you know, it, it requires a little bit of a transition in the way that you deploy a self-expanding valve, but once we made that transition some years ago, it's really a very reliable way. Um, we do cusp overlap technique for the Navator. We also do it for Evolute. Um, I think it's very important after you deploy um, to the to the hard stop that you then add some uh, LAO in order uh, in order to get uh, to take the parallax out of the valve frame itself to really assess the depth, and then once you confirm that that looks good, to release it. Um, you know, high deployments in order to get low pacemaker rates is something that that has been growing more and more over the past years. Um, and I think with an intraannular valve like this, um, since the 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 uh, neo skirt height is low enough, I don't think there's much of a penalty for that in the long run. Well, thank you for that uh, that great overview on the cusp overlap uh, view. Uh, I'm going to go to the chat now. We've got a couple of questions, and we'll pose this to both of you. Uh, uh, Dr. Hilton will ask you first: uh, How often do you pre-bill before valve deployment? I'm sorry, say that one more time, Nadine. How often? How often do you do a, a pre dilation before you deploy the valve? On every case, on select cases, uh, what's your approach? Yeah, 100% of the time when we use a self expanding valve. Totally agree. And, um, yes. How about you, Dr. Korngold? Yes, every time for both uh, Evolute and, uh, and uh, 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 Navtar. I think that's great. You know, that's uh, what we've recommended from uh, from Abbott's perspective. We feel like this uh, makes the procedure go much easier. Uh, oftentimes, it's difficult to predict what's going to happen, uh, and uh, I think it's it's a it's great to hear both uh, operators uh, with such experience uh, essentially saying the same thing. Uh, a second question from the chat, uh, and this one actually specifically uh, the writer wants Dr. Cornwell to answer this. Do you see any role in using a Lunderquist in highly tortuous anatomies with FlexNav system? Um, it's an interesting question. You know, I I don't love using the Lunderquist as much as possible. It's just incredibly stiff. It's incredibly um, harsh wire to park in the left ventricle. Um, you know, particularly if you're dealing with older people, I just think um, I, I think it can be a site of uh, potential trauma. Um, we often think about using the Lunderquist when you're really trying to sort of force a valve with a lot of force through tortuous iliac arteries. But the Navitar is really sort of a different approach. It's much more flexible uh, with the coatings. It just sort of slips through stuff a lot easier. So in general, this is um, I, I just don't really find that I need that stiff of a wire. And uh, and I, I use the um, the extra small safari for virtually all of my cases. Um, so yeah, I think there's a penalty to using the Lundquist, and I just haven't really felt too compelled to use it for this device. Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts uh, on, on the choice of wires. Uh, it's always an important question. Um, uh, next question from the chat uh, is for uh, Dr. Sultan. Uh, what are your thoughts on using an encapsulated valve uh, with, with a long sheath Versus, uh, uh, I think that the I think well, I'll just rephrase the question. I'm not sure how it's worded yet. I think the question, the gist of the question is, what are your thoughts on using a valve in which you have to do sheath exchange with the integrated sheath versus uh, a valve uh, uh, where you just sort of place a sheath and put the valve through that way? What What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think you could use this platform both ways, right? I mean, if you've got a Lourdes patient with a very, gen you know, with generous iliofemorals, you could certainly go down that pathway. You know, I don't look at it as a negative. I recognize that it is an added step where you put a sheath in, BAV, uh, take the sheath out and put the valve in. I, I completely agree that it is an added step. And, and I think, you know, for, for the most part, uh, I do you think it's important for us to look beyond sheath exchanges, uh, beyond the cc's of dye used, uh, to really think at what we're doing? I mean, this is not a rescue uh, or a salvage procedure anymore. This is something that patients expect to go on and live their lives for the next decade. Uh, so I think, you know, if we have to do an, a sheath exchange or so uh, to get a really good valve in that'll give them good hemodynamics and an option for tab and tab in the future. I mean, I take those couple of sheath exchanges. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, I think uh, there, there probably are patients in, in whom a 
it's good to have a sheet in place, but I, I found with the Navator systems that I talk to operators around around the world uh, is that with the uh, minimal um, profile, it, that's less and less necessary as, as time goes by. Uh, actually, I want to ask uh, both of you a question, um, and this is a, a discussion about lifetime management, which I, I think is an important discussion. It's being talked about a lot um, on the podium, uh, and specifically, one aspect of it is a neo skirt height. Um, just uh, we'll we'll start with uh, Dr. Korngold first. Uh, tell me what your perspectives are and why neo skirt height is an important uh, factor to consider. Um. I think, you know, as we've talked about in this, you know, we're not only looking to get the patient out of the room, but we're thinking about what happens 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. And I think that um, there's a real penalty for these uh, super annular valves, with a lot of valve material that um, risks either uh, occluding the coronaries or sequestering the, uh, the, the sinus. Um, I think staying intraannular in general leaves many more options open. Um, and so having a low neoskirt height and having um, and, and, and just sort of keeping the height of the actual valve material as low as possible on the way from the corner is really just preserves options. The, you know, in the past, there has been this narrative that super annular valves equals better hemodynamics equals better longevity. And we know now that that's not true, that we can get hemodynamics that are excellent without being super annular. And I think that calls into question this whole idea of longevity. I don't think it's related to super annular or interannular. Not sure if it's related to hemodynamics, but what I do know is that the hemodynamics that we can get off of the Navator are really virtually identical to the hemodynamics that we're getting off of the, uh, the, the Evolute FX system. Yeah, you know, it, it's an interesting discussion, isn't it? Uh, we, we talk about uh, someone who comes in with severe aortic stenosis. Uh, I, I kind of compare it to, to a cancer diagnosis, right? It, it's actually got a higher mortality than many cancer diagnoses. And when, when a cancer patient comes in, we don't, we don't sort of talk about, hey, let's treat your cancer kind of halfway because we're worried about what might happen down the road. You, know, you, you want to fully treat the problem now. And of course, if you have the correct platform, the issues of lifetime management, future uh, uh, future access issues, and future tab and tab. If you've got a good design, those those should be addressed by the design that's there now, but also future technology. So, with that in mind, uh, uh, Dr. Sultan, what are your thoughts on lifetime management, neo skirt height, and other aspects that are important uh, as these discussions are really occurring on the podium uh, about future uh, ten years, twenty years down the road? It's become a game of chess now, right? We should just put a valve in. But now we have to think about many other things down the road. Please share your thoughts uh, about uh, these issues with us. Yeah, no, I think these are great discussions, and I and I I'd say mostly agree with what Ethan said, which is I think uh, you know neoskirt height, i.e., creating a neoskirt covered stent uh, within a tab and tap uh, procedure it is concerning, and and I think not just. Uh, uh, not just to say that, you know, we have leaflet modification procedures that may mitigate this. I think technology is getting better and better and, uh, and quite frankly, slicker that we can do this comfortably. Uh, but I think knowing what we know now, uh, I think it's important for us uh, to, to plan for, you know, again, the lifetime management concept, which has to be more than a buzzword or paying lip service, right? So I think to to paraphrase what you just said, uh, Nadeem, uh, if a patient comes to us with severe aortic stenosis, they shouldn't leave us with moderate aortic stenosis. Uh, you know, you should eliminate their aortic stenosis, and, and that should be the goal. Uh, and I think while accomplishing that goal, uh, you want to ensure that you're leaving time for, you're leaving an opportunity uh, for a tab and tab, which again, an intra on your valve does. And I fully agree with Ethan that you don't have to be super annular to get the hemodynamics. It's more about valve design. So intra annular valves such as Navator can get you that. But what we do know is good hemodynamics do make a difference. We've known, again, this is this, these are old data that have existed in the surgical literature for a long time, where if you've got good hemodynamics to start, those valves are going to be Durable down the line, unless there's an intrinsic problem. So, so that is something we've known. So, we do, we would expect that a valve that has good hemodynamics is likely going to to last, and a valve with good hemodynamics and a tab and tab option. I mean, 
I, I would think that's a win-win scenario. Well, thank you for, for those uh, really great insights. A uh, couple of questions from the chat, which are actually very interesting. So for both of you, um, uh, presently, Navator is approved in high and extreme risk indications. So um, give us an idea of when you're doing uh, patient selection for Navator, how does that play into your decision making today? Uh, we, we hope that will change in the future, but today this is how the indication is. Um, talk, talk to us a little bit about, about that. Yeah, I mean, in, I, I, oh, go, go ahead, ahead, please. Uh, I think, I mean, the simple answer would be, I think this is, a, this is as I said, this is, a, this is a great technology and valve for high and extreme risk patients. But I really think this is going to shine in the low and intermediate risk population. I think we're moving away from, from risk and talking about you know, life expectancy in younger patients. So I think in a young patient who has significant life expectancy, I think this is where this valve is going to shine because it's going to give you the best of both worlds with hemodynamics and, uh, uh, quite frankly, uh, a tab and tab option. So, uh, so again, I think having that is so much more important in the low and intermediate risk population. Dr. Korngold, any thoughts on um, patient yeah. selection? I think very well said. I think, you know, if we're looking at younger patients, we're often faced with the choice of do I want to jail the coronaries for life with an Evolute or do I want to have suboptimal hemodynamics with a, uh, with a Sapien? And this is a different option that gives the best of both worlds. You know, you get good hemodynamics, you have good coronary access, and you have good future valve and valve options. So I think this really sort of breaks, uh, breaks that paradigm. Well, thank you. Um, is a, another very interesting question, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase the question a little bit. Uh, uh, again, a hot podium topic these days. Um, uh, so and that's commercial alignment. Um, what does that mean? Is that there's some uh, uh, non-clinical sort of bench type data that suggests it may be important in hemodynamics, and it may be important in uh, thrombogenicity, um, and, and even future sort of lifetime uh, management uh, issues based on um, if the commissures are aligned and what you can do with a future tab and tab option in that setting. Uh, so uh, for, for both of you, please talk to us about your approach to commercial alignment uh, in the absence of, of sort of hard clinical data, but we do know it's an important factor. All the experts are talking about it. And it is something that I think will probably impact uh, uh, design in, in, in future iterations of, uh, for all companies. So we'll, we'll start with you, Dr. Sultan. What are your thoughts on commercial alignment? And then we'll go to Dr. Kornvold. Yeah, I think it's easy for us to say that, you know, you probably don't need to worry about it too much for coronary access um, with this because it's such large cell design and intranular aspect. But I think what you alluded to is important. We know that if you're misaligned, you probably have a greater risk of halt than ham down the line. Uh, so we do think it's important. I think this technology allows you to commercially align comfortably. Uh, I mean, Lars Sondergaard and his, and his group published a very nice series uh, using the Navator FlexNav platform. Uh, that really go over how you can commissionally align and, and have that be predictable. So, you know, we do think it's important. It is theoretical and sometimes becomes more of a podium discussion. But I think if we have the option to be able to do it, and since the platform allows you to do it, I mean, I, I do think it's an important consideration. Dr. Korngold, any thoughts on commercial alignment? Yeah, I mean, I think commercial alignment is critical when it comes to superannular valves because we know that if you're intraannular, whether or not you're aligned, your coronary access is going to be better than even the best commercially aligned superannular valve. And a non commercially aligned superannular valve is incredibly difficult to get coronary access. Um, that being said, I think all things being equal, yeah, I think there's probably an advantage that will be there to have a commercially aligned valve as long as it's not too challenging or dangerous to achieve commissioner alignment. If it starts adding a lot of time to the procedure, if you're doing other maneuvers that introduce a lot of contrast or other risks, it may not be worth it for some older patients who are you're not expecting a valve and valve down the road. Um, but I think that um, all things being equal, yeah, this is appealing. And I think this platform gives us options for commissioner alignment. Um, so it's sort of future proof in that. So I, I think there's more to come in this space, but uh, it's a nice to have feature. 
Well, thanks for that uh, insightful answer from both of you. And uh, this actually brings us to the uh, end of our time together. And again, uh, Dr. Uh, Ibrahim, Dr. Korngold, thank you so much for uh, the excellent uh, presentations and the discussions and sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. And thank you to the audience for, again, uh, taking time away from your, your families and your personal time to spend it with us this evening. And we're hopeful that this was worthwhile for you. So with that, I bid you good night um, and uh, safe travels. Thank you.